Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for the introduction, although I have to offer a slight correction. Uh, <laughs> I'm one of the developers. Uh, Jeff Wagner is, is really the lead of, of technical infrastructure. Um, but today, um, I'm going to be talking about um, broadly a lot of our efforts in infrastructure um, supporting open force field supporting force field science and a little bit of the science that the scientists are actually doing. Um, I promise I will get these slides posted at some point. I'm not actually sure where at the moment. Um, and I am mostly presenting work that other people did. So I want to be super clear that uh, most of the credit, in fact, only vanished in the small portion, uh, goes to me. Um, quite frankly, down to most of the slides I've taken from other people's presentations. Um, so I, I kind of realize now that this audience probably already knows what a force field is, um, but, but please bear with me for a couple minutes um, because I, I, I will arrive at a, a, a somewhat unique point here. So if I'm explaining what I do to my friends that are programmers outside of science or attempting to explain my role, um, I like to start with um, just the hydrogen-oxygen bond in water, um, explaining that there's all sorts of cool chemistry and physics you can do, but we're going to, um, for sort of uh, obvious reasons of computational speed, not going to go all the way down to Harvey Fock and such, we're just going to uh, use a sort of ball and stick model like everybody did in, in high school. And for this, um, if we just think about the bond stretching, we will um, use a, a harmonic oscillator using just the simple spring uh, equation. And if we want to actually capture the physics of the water, uh, of th this portion of the physics of the water, we're going to have two fitted parameters. We're going to have some energy that kind of keeps it at an equilibrium distance. That'll be a fitted parameter. And we'll also have a bond length that will be a fitted parameter. Um, and so this becomes something you can collect data on. Um, you can get the equilibrium bond length, and there's some experiments you can do to get an idea of sort of uh, this energy curve. So you could do whatever sort of fitting you want, and you can have a pretty good idea, or you could uh, develop a pretty good model for that sort of super specific subphysics. Um, of course, in reality, and you know, to do stuff like this, this is not just one piece of one molecule. Uh, in practice, um, the sort of stuff that, that runs behind the scenes on like folding at home and sort of pharmaceutical companies everywhere uses um, this big equation up top, which sums over a ton of interactions, um, has a bunch of terms, and naturally has a ton of fitted parameters. So things get a lot more complex a lot more quickly. Um, and also the chemistry gets much more complex um, because there's much more to uh, the world than just, just, uh, just a couple of elements. Uh, one parameter here I want to uh, highlight is the dihedral angle. So this is used to, um, uh, this is very important for getting the structure of molecules right, in including biomolecules and macromolecules. Uh, it's defined as if you take a quartet of atoms, you take the first three, and then the last three make planes out of each of those. And then you want to basically try to push um, that the, ro the rotation of that central bond to some angle um, that, that you'll use in fitting. Um, and so going back to, I think, maybe the 80s, but, but certainly a few decades now, um, the conventional approach to doing this um, was to use atom types. So um, if we take two uh, simple but not quite trivial molecules of, of propane and benzene, um, and let's just look at the carbons, um, we can, uh, if, we, if we wanted to develop a model that would capture more than just these two molecules, what we could do is we could say, well, these carbons and the propane are, um, are aliphatic, and you know, they'll probably be similar enough to hexane. Let's create an atom type called CT. Um, and then my non-bonded parameters are going to be um, sort of all, all, always, whenever I see a CT, I'm going to assign particular parameters to those. On a separate molecule like benzene, we have aromatic properties, so the physics is going to be different. Let's make a different atom type. All the benzene carbons are gonna get CA, and CA and CT are gonna have different parameters. 
Um, if we think about the other terms, like our, our bonds angles, and in particular our dihedrals, these are going to be defined by um, sequences of these atom types. So for example, if I looked at four adjacent carbons in my benzene, um, this is a molecule that we know is going to be planar. So my dihedral term is going to want to keep this flat. So in other words, if I see four CAs next to each other, uh, part of my force field is, is gonna want to keep those flat. And there's, you know, this has been sort of the underpinning of tons and tons of companies and I believe a couple novels as well. Um, but there are some problems with conventional force fields. Uh, one example that, that, that we like to use a lot are these biphenyl molecules where you take, kind of you take two benzenes and you just put a carbon-carbon bond between them. Uh, if, if you look at any of the carbons, you'll see, well, they're aromatic, so we'll probably get them a, give them a CA atom type. And that works great for the atoms in the ring, but if you look at the central bond um, in the middle, the torsion there is going to be modeled pretty poorly. Um, even though we have four CAs all, uh, all next to each other, um, that bond does not, that, that bond does not actually want to be planar uh, in reality. It wants to um, sort of be uh, offset a little bit. Um, and there are, there are tons of ways of getting around this problem, but um, if you kind of dig deeper and deeper, you kind of continuously encounter these problems where the, the way the atom types um, are used uh, introduces sort of um, two problems. One is that your atom types couple are, are, are coupled into all of your valence parameters, in particular your, your torsions give you a lot of trouble usually. And the sort of rules that are used to define, excuse me, used to uh, determine what atom types go where are uh, not quite so strongly rooted in chemistry. So a few years ago, some people got together and said, hey, uh, let's, let's think of maybe a, a different way of doing this um, from kind of a, a ground up perspective. And, and out of this came the Smirnoff specification. Um, so this uses Smirks, which is a subset of, I think potentially a subset of Smiles, which is um, kind of this highly specific to cheminformatics experts uh, grammar for describing, uh, describing the chemistry of, of molecules, usually sort of in a, in a very local context. So this looks like gibberish to uh, you know, a lot of people, and it, and it did for me a couple years ago. Uh, but there's a lot of really rich information encoded in, in just this pattern, for example. Um, and also, um, smarts and this whole sort of world of, of, of 2D uh, computational chemistry has a ton of time and a lot of companies, a lot of tools behind it. So um, if you wanted to think about building infrastructure based off of this, you would kind of be starting from, uh, from the beginning all over again but you'd have a ton of tools out there, um, are out there to, to build off of. Um, and I want to make it clear from here, uh, two things. One is that the, the way that parameters are assigned uh, bypasses the need to assign atom types altogether. So you can kind of uh, really more, more directly use the language of chemistry to determine what parameters you get. Um, this is what we call direct chemical perception. Um, and the other thing is that instead of previously using your atom types to determine what your bond angle and torsion parameters uh, are going to be, those are all completely decoupled. So if you wanted to make a custom torsion, um, sort of with, with conventional atom types, you would need to generate, you, you'd need to define some new rules based off of your atom types and things explode in complexity pretty quickly. But with everything decoupled, there's a lot of uh, simplicity that, that, that falls out of that. So um, this is around 20, maybe 2015 to 2017 or so. Um, and at, at this point in time, it's kind of one of these things that I, I think most people in this room have encountered a lot and, and been a part of a lot, which is uh, an idea that looks great and it seems like you could do a lot of cool stuff, but it's kind of, it's kind of just an idea. It hasn't, new stuff hasn't been built with it. And sort of, productionalizing uh, really exciting uh, and novel ideas like that that you add is that, is, an is that it is an implementation of the Smirnoff format. So um, the, 
Smirnoff style force fields are encoded as uh, OFF XML files, and the toolkit provides uh, routines for um, parsing, writing them back out. Um, you can load one into memory, you can sort of inspect all of the parameters, uh, excuse me, in, uh, in a force field. Um, and then you can kind of put all that together and you can say I have a molecule or I have a you know, box of molecules and I have a force field. I want to do something with that and out of that you can create an open MIM system. Um, and there's a lot more stuff coming soon, a lot of interoperability stuff, but the, the sort of headline of stuff that we're in the process of getting out the door right now actually um, are uh, we're loading up, uh, we're adding in the tooling to load up biopolymer PDB files uh, and um, kind of retooling some of the infrastructure to uh, parameterize proteins. Um, another pretty important tool that was what was built is called OpenFF Evaluator. Um, you may have known it a few years ago under the name, I believe it was Property Estimator. Um, and so the, the problem that this tackles is um, if, uh, if a little bit ago, if we're, if we're talking QC compute, um, these are pretty expensive to get your reference data, but once you have the reference data and you wanted to ask, is this candidate force field accurately modeling um, the geometry of this molecule, that calculation takes like, I think a few milliseconds to do um, because force fields are fast. But if you wanna look at condensed phase property, like is my density of water uh, remotely uh, accurate? Then those are calculations that take on the order of more like a kind of a few hours um, and, and a little bit longer for uh, more involved stuff like enthalpy of vaporization, uh, free energy solvation and such. Um, and this is, these are the sorts of calculations that uh, scientists do all the time, but we want this to be really, really scalable. Um, so Evaluator is a tool that automates, um, aut that, 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 that really um, efficiently automates this. Um, there's a handful of different physical properties that it works with um, and it does, it runs, uh, runs well on HPC clusters and such. Uh, another key, another really integral tool is um, how you actually do the fitting. Um, so there are, I'm sure there are more optimization libraries out there than, than any of us could count. Um, but in this case, we wanted to do, use something that, uh, you know, already had some of the domain specific knowledge um, that we're, we're after. Uh, and uh, force balance has been the workhorse for open force field for, for, se for several years now. So it's a gradient-based optimizer um, from Li Ping Wang when I believe he was in VJ, uh, uh, VJ's lab uh, a few years ago. Um, and it, uh, before open force field, it was used to retune um, sort of the, the tip three, four, five P water models and it had some great results with that. So the thinking was that would be a great tool to use for our force field fitting and, 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 and it's, it's, worked, it's worked well. So this is sort of what it looks like to put it all together. Um, kind, of, kind of moving left to right, but with a few uh, iteration loops. So you'll start with some initial force field and then um, you'll generate a lot of data. Um, something I didn't mention is the uh, physical property data we get, um, to my knowledge, we get all of this from NIST databases, uh, which is great because we didn't need to, you know, we didn't need to uh, curate that, generate that data at all. I should say there's a little bit of curation in terms of picking what you want. But with a given initial force field um, and your reference data, um, the iteration loops are basically to load everything up into the toolkit, use evaluator to um, compare your, uh, the, the properties predicted by your force field to your um, experimental properties. And then based off of the um, differences there, use force balance to uh, tune your force field, iterate this some sort of unknown number of times. Um, and then if the benchmarks look good, then you say we have released a force field. Um, so this is the process that was used um, to generate Parsley. Uh, there was certainly plenty of automation uh, at the time, um, but still there's ultimately a lot of people effort um, that goes into doing something like this. 
um, many, a lot of grad student and postdoc effort uh, went in, excuse me, uh, went into Parsley. Um, and the results were um, benchmarking force fields is sort of uh, complex territory, but I think it's I think it's accurate to say that performance in general was competitive, but a little bit behind the state of the art. Um, and what's on the right here that you can't probably see very well is a is a figure from the preprint, um, where looking at I believe these are uh, these are some sort of uh, protein ligand binding ener energies. Um, Parsley was just a little bit behind GAF and OPLS3, and a little bit better than CGNFF. So it's 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 competitive. Um, what was pretty remarkable about what was pretty remarkable about this was that it was basically a year after uh, open force field started, and there's already a force field that, that was produced. So kind of building off that success, um, the initiative was able to hire two new people, um, David, who is here, and me, who is me. Um, so earlier when I said I'm mostly presenting work that other people did, I wasn't kidding. Uh, everything up until now is work that was done before I was hired. <laughs> um, so some of the improvements that have happened since Parsley, um, I'll be going over next. Um, one of them is that, um, so QCR Archive is great at uh, doing the compute, but um, there can kind of be a lot of human work that goes into uh, basically feeding QC Archive with the right data. Um, so we wanted to build some automation around that. And this is something that came together, I think, pretty quickly and has, to my knowledge, been working very well since then. Um, the two tools are, well, the, the core tool is called QC Submit, which is sort of an open force field interface to QC Archive. And then on top of that, to, to really deploy this, um, we have a, you wouldn't quite call it a standalone tool, but we have a, a repo called QCA dataset submission that has a lot of automation um, built into this. It's pretty cool to see it happen live. Um, uh, the, it uses the GitHub API to like update PRs. It, sorry, the, the compute submissions are done as PRs and uh, the automation uses stuff like the, the GitHub projects page to uh, move everything around. Um, and then as these data sets turn away, you'll get an update once a day that gives, uh, gives you information about here are, the, here are the jobs that are finished, here are the ones that are uh, error cycling and such. Um, I should add briefly that uh, we kind of get a lot of compute for free from various sources, but under the condition that uh, the jobs can only ever be preemptible. So um, these are like super duper free queues. And, and generally if there's like five minutes or 20 minutes on some HVC cluster uh, in between submissions, um, these these jobs will be summed up on there. The downside is that your jobs are gonna get killed uh, before they're done almost all the time. So that's uh, that's why these uh, will, will take a little bit to turn away. Um, uh, since, uh, yeah, over the years we've used a ton of compute. Um, I, I was trying to get a plot of the actual number of CPU hours, uh, but that's a little bit difficult to get. Uh, fortunately what is easy to get is the number of jobs computed. So it might be a little bit hard to read there, but we're approaching about three million jobs. Um, and three million jobs is a lot when each of your jobs could be up to like, uh, a few days of CPU time, or sorry, a, a few days of, of wall time. Um, so speaking very roughly, we're probably in the tens of millions of CPU hours of compute use over the years, which generates a lot of data. Um, so, okay, something else that uh, happened after Parsley was, um, thank you, uh, so Parsley, uh, the, the physical properties used in fitting Parsley were all pure components. So, you know, just, it would just be, let's see how, you know, let, let's, just, let's just feed hexane into our, into our input system. Um, but one of the scientific ideas that, that, that found its way into production was also using mixture data. Um, and uh, it's just one of those things that appears to have just 
worked really well. So uh, feeding in mixture data in addition to the pure property data um, was one of the things that went into Sage that improved its, uh, in, its uh, properties quite a bit. So um, in 2020, there were a couple of uh, small patch releases to Parsley, but the next major release was last year, um, at, at some point last summer, with OpenFF 2.0, which uh, is codenamed Sage. Um, this was not fundamental, the, the fitting process here was not fundamentally too different in terms of the sort of the types of inputs that went into Parsley, but a lot of the infrastructure became much more automated um, and there was a lot more data that went into it. Um, and so what I'm showing here are um, free energies of solvation, um, which is a, a very important property for um, our, uh, a lot of our users. And what these plots show is that Sage performs consistently a little bit better in these free energy calculations than Parsley did. And that's cool, but it was especially cool because th that was not an input. So the inputs were QM data and physical properties. We kind of, it was kind of anybody's guess if improving the QM and physical property matching uh, would actually get the free energies any better. Um, and they did. Uh, so that, that kind of brings us to today. Um, I wanted to briefly talk about sort of our, our organizational structure. So today we are under um, the Open Molecular Software Foundation, which is a nonprofit that was funded um, uh, funded to um, um, funded kind of in the spirit of the the early days of of Open Force Field, and um, I briefly showed some of the people that we've hired, um, but we've also sort of continued to grow over the, year, over the, over the years, um, all the way to having a, an actual project manager, um, which is pretty cool. Um, I will say that we are on OpenMM, or we are on Conda Forge, um, and I will skip through some of this other stuff, um, except, yes. Okay, um, I think I will just end with saying that um, I think what, what makes Open Forest Field unique as, as an organization is that openness is really, really woven in everywhere into just about everything we do. So I talked earlier about to make a forest field, you need infrastructure, you need data, and you have benchmarks. And to do that, we're using open science, open data, and open software. Um, I don't have enough time to go over into that, I don't think. Um, here's a bunch of links that will be on the slides that are posted online. Um, and here's contact information if you want to reach out to me or the organization more directly. And I'd be happy to take questions. Okay, thank you, Matt, for the great talk. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, I have a question from Leo, the co-host that um, is hosting things remotely. Um, and he's asking that this sounds very similar to open kin efforts for um, interatomic potentials. How does the OpenFF relate to this effort? And are you working together in any way with open kin? Yeah. Um, I, good, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's pretty accurate, yeah, to say that we're a similar effort to open kin. Um, we're not working with them directly at the moment. Um, we've had some conversations in the past about doing that. Um, but uh, our focus really is on the biophysical applications, the, the sort of drug discovery, and OpenChem is more focused on, as I understand it, um, these novel interatomic potentials that are more for material science. So um, I don't think there's a, a fundamental reason at all that we couldn't work together and do cool stuff, but I think in, in practical terms, it mostly makes sense to do sort of the parallel efforts that we have now. Anyone else? Thank you. Um, I would be interested, how far are we away from like benchmarks in comparison to an experiment? So can you give like a, a rough feeling now that you have all the benchmarks from simulation, do you also compare to experiment? How are we, is it qualitative agreement or can we also read quantitative agreement? Maybe a comment on it. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
benchmarking is kind of tough to talk about uh, because it's uh, it's it's a it's a topic that takes a little bit of you kind of need people to agree on which uh, properties you actually care about. Um, so what one group of people agrees to might be what might be different than what another people. What one person agree what, what, what one group agrees with about uh, one month might be different than the next than the next month. Um, so let me think the, the best way, uh, let me think of the, the, the best way to answer this. Um, I guess yeah, it just kind of it, it kind of depends on which properties you care about. Um, I'm not sure I understand what like quantitatively matching experiments. Um, so I guess you always have two options, right? So I can take DFT data or any kind of quantum data to train my model on, or I can use experimental measurements and say, okay, this is the quantity. This should be the result of a certain measurement. Um, so the question is now, how do I weight this, right? So do I say I only fit on DFT, then I might be very good to reproduce this. I mean, I come from a different community, so I'm just interested how, how you guys handled this. Okay, yeah. Uh, I, um, thanks for thanks for clarifying. I, I think the best answer I can give you is that uh, we use both of them. Um, as far as, you know, it's probably not a 50-50 fit. Um, uh, being more detailed than than saying it's it's... It's some, some the, the weighting is, it is something where uh, they both matter a lot. Um, at, at, at the implementation level, there's not like a global parameter that says how much we care about QM versus experiment. Um, that more feeds into individual, individual targets. Um, so uh, that, that, I think that's the best answer I can give. Um, if, you, if you want to follow up with me later, I would know who, to, who, who, who would give you a better answer. <laughs> Have one more question. Any plans for polarizable force fields infrastructure and building them at this point? Yeah, so I, um, because I, I totally misjudged the, the time here, um, I had to blaze past uh, the next kind of year or two roughly of our efforts. Um, I would say the plans for polarizability right now are still a little bit far off. Um, I think we all recognize it's it's super important for getting for getting some properties right, but in terms of the other things that we might want to do, like adding virtual sites, um, it's it's been deprioritized a little bit. Um, and also, um, as I understand it right now, the infrastructure around that with all the different various community tools is um, is much more disparate than. Um, than something like virtual sites, for example, because it also ties into the integrator and stuff. So it's it's on our radar and we would love to, but it's it, it's probably going to be a couple years away. Um, all right, let's thank Matt again.